Good evening. I'm Liz Goldstein, Executive Director of the Anticoagulation Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This is the first time in a while we've done an evening Eastern time program, and we'd love to hear if you prefer this time or earlier in the day. So please feel free to email info at acforum.org with your feedback. I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. I know it's a very busy week, so let's get started. Today we'll be discussing a rapid resource from the AC Forum, Reversal and Treatment Strategies for DOAC-Related Bleeding. Rapid resources are a new tool from the AC Forum. We've created 12 of these one-page quick guides. Please visit our Centers of Excellence at excellence.acforum.org to access the additional topics. So this webinar is accredited for physicians, nurses, and pharmacists. Please visit AC Forum's website or the direct link on this slide to claim your credit. Um, I think the link is also being put in the chat box. I am thrilled to have all five authors of this rapid resource on the webinar today, and Dr. Scott Cates will be presenting an overview of the tool. Dr. Cates is a hospitalist at Henry Ford Hospital and the president of the AC Forum. He is an international expert in the field of anticoagulation, serves on many boards, speaks widely, and published, has published over 250 manuscripts. Dr. Megan Barra is a clinical pharmacist specialist in neurocritical care at Mass General Hospital in Boston and has a particular interest in antithrombotic therapy and reversal in patients with neurologic injury. Dr. Adam Sucor specializes in hematology and lab medicine at Penn Medicine in Philadelphia. Dr. Sucor is executive editor of ASH's hematology journal and chair of the ASH guidelines on VTE. He is also an AC Forum board member and perhaps most famous for starting this webinar program along with Scott Cates back in 2013. Dr. Ronnie Nemeth is a manager of the anti, quite, uh, sorry, is the manager of the anticoagulation clinic and co-chair for the anticoagulation steering committee for confluence health in the state of washington and last but definitely not least is dr kelly rudd who is the director of network pharmacy services at bassett healthcare and clinical pharmacy specialist focusing on anticoagulation dr rudd is the president-elect of the national certification Board of Anticoagulation Providers and also serves on the AC Forum Centers of Excellence team. Here are our financial disclosures. Please feel free to ask questions during the presentation using the Q&A box. The chat has been disabled. Thank you again to our authors and to everyone joining us today. And I'd like to now introduce Dr. Scott Cates. Well, thanks so much, Liz, and uh, welcome, uh, everyone. As you can see, I'm in my really fancy COVID uh, guard just coming off the uh, floor. So I appreciate as we go through this, and thanks to the co-authors that really spent a lot of careful thought in putting this rapid resource together. And I just love these. I, I think these are sort of handy. You pin these up in the anticoagulation clinic or have a folder with these. One page right to the uh, heart of the issue is what our design was uh, for this. Um, if you wanna download this and have this, if you have a second screen or print it, you'll be able to follow along. We're gonna ping back and forth from you letting to see what the overall one page looks like. I know you can't read it. And then we're gonna blow up each section and talk along the way. And what we'll also do is we'll have some conversation along the way. Please feel, to, uh, feel free to send us some questions and we will field the questions that have already been submitted. Liz, could I have the next slide, please? So here are the two sections that we're gonna talk about uh, next. Next slide, please. So just as a way of some background, these are not in on the rapid resource, but just a level set uh, everyone. We know that the uh, direct oral anticoagulants compared to vitamin K antagonists have a better bleeding profile. But still, we get about a 2.1 to 3.6% rate of bleeding when we look at the phase three trials predominantly with atrial fibrillation and venous thromboembolic disease. So I think as a working number right there, you can use the 2 to 3% rate per year is bleed rates. And that distribution is predominantly GI bleeding uh, versus intracranial hemorrhage, ICH. 
And we would expect a little more GI bleeding in atrial fibrillation trials and venous thromboembolic uh, disease trials because the group in the AFib uh, population is about 15 years older than the VTE. So you can see where these bleeds are going to be in the magnitude and rate of them per year. Next slide, please, Liz. So I think what's very important, however, is to appreciate what the 30-day mortality rate is in DOAC-associated hemorrhage. And this is just about the same in vitamin K average. So we have major bleed mortality. This is a thing that's called case fatality rate. So if a patient is on an anticoagulant and bleeds, anywhere from 8.9 to 20% of those patients will die within the next 30 days. And of course, we would expect this greater in, in, in bleeds in the head. And when we call it, say intracranial hemorrhage, we're talking about both intracerebral actually bleeding into the deep tissue of the brain and outside the brain, but still in the head, i.e. epidural, subdural uh, hematomas. The other thing that we have to realize is that when we withhold anticoagulation after a bleed, and a lot of this data is, is, is done more in AFib, but some in VTE, is the rate of overall mortality in observational, not randomized trials, is increased. So a very, very important uh, point here in what we're gonna call out a couple of times in this one pager is have a plan for how you're going to anticoagulate the patient afterwards. And if you can anticoagulate the patient, particularly in the atrial fibrillation population, then there are still alternatives for stroke prevention like Watchman and uh, left atrial appendage occlusion devices. But really the patient shouldn't be leaving the hospital without that plan in place. Next slide, please. A host of um, of uh, guidelines and guidance. And some of the reasons I say guidance instead of guidelines is sometimes the data is not robust uh, for this. I'll point out a, a couple of ones. One, the American Society of Hematology, mostly because uh, Adam, who's on the uh, call, does a lot of work in that and is, has led those. And then, of course, I'm a little biased, and I think the anticoagulation forum ones are also particularly useful. Next slide, please. Okay, so Mark Crowther, our immediate uh, past president of uh, AC Forum, has a saying that I really like. He says, anticoagulation pills don't put holes in blood vessels. So what you have to remember to do is do all the other things. I think holding an anticoagulant when red blood, red stuff is coming out of your patient is sort of straightforward, but also don't forget the mechanical things. I will sometimes call for a uh, relatively urgent uh, endoscopic procedure, either upper or lower GI. And, and I've sometimes had the resident say, well, the patient's vomiting blood, don't you know where the blood's coming from? I said, yeah, I want you to come and stop it with local measures, topical agents. And then of course we have to support the patient with transfusions, et cetera. Next slide, please. We, I'm sorry, go back a slide for a moment, Liz. But we, uh, so these are there and we're gonna call those out a little bit just as to not forget that because sometimes we think about the drug more than we think about all the other things that go towards stopping bleeding. Next slide, please. And then here is just the definitions. We'll try to not use these and, and uh, think about them. But if you have this in front of you, if we slip into using the abbreviations, here they are. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we've tried to do is put right at the front, on the top, on the left, first thing to read is the bottom line. So let's go to that bottom line. Next slide, please, Liz. So we've uh, categorized these into do, don'ts, considers, and cautions. I know we have 12 rapid resources. Um, we are now starting to try this out as a format for our rapid resources uh, going forward and our most recent ones also use this format. So what you do want to do is determine the time from the last dose. And you'll see when we get into the conversations in a couple of slides where that is important on the dosing, particularly for indexinet alpha. The other thing I think is 
is important. If the patient hasn't taken drug in a couple of days, and you can get that history, and many times you can't think intracranial hemorrhage unconscious uh, patient, but if you can, you have to think through the kinetics of the drug, and maybe there's not a lot of drug left, and you might not need to reverse this given no matter what you uh, are going to use for a reversal agent. And then do reverse life-threatening or uncontrolled bleeding. And we were very cautious to actually use what the FDA labeling is. So that's verbatim, life-threatening or uncontrolled bleeding. And then we say that you should do that for the uh, 10A inhibitors, particularly a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban, where it's approved, we recommend Indexinet Alpha. And for Dabigatran, we recommend Idareucizumab. And then, as I've already mentioned, we put excuse me, in the due column, remember to have an anticoagulation plan or at least a stroke prevention plan um, with, if you're going to use a mechanical means for atrial uh, appendage occlusion or maybe the rare time that you would think about an IVC filter in your patient with uh, venous thromboembolic disease that you absolutely cannot restart an anticoagulant, but for the most part, you're able to. Don't give FFP, really no indication at all to use FFP for DOAC reversal, although I continue to see it frequently. And uh, don't delay administration of the reversal agent uh, while you're waiting for lab results. And Adam's going to uh, speak for that. But if the patient is really, really hemorrhaging a lot or in a critical air, just uh, give it and worry about what the lab tests are later. Consider reversing with a PCC versus we're gonna use prothrombin complex concentrate PCC as an abbreviation or the little a next to that in the first bullet under consider, little a activated PCC if a specific reversal agent is uh, not available. And we'll apply that to both indexinet alpha and idareucizumab. And then consider activated charcoal if ingestion, you can get that history has been recently, just so you can suck up what's left in the gut so it doesn't get absorbed. That's sort of common overdose uh, 101 sort of uh, stuff. Hemodialysis has really only been talked about in the literature for idareucizumab. I'm sorry, uh, for, um, for dabigatran, and the reason for that is, remember, dabigatran is 80% renally excreted, and then laboratory measures, if you can get them rapidly, and we'll talk about what you can maybe and may not use as a surrogate measure if you don't have a DOAC-specific rapid uh, test uh, result available. I don't in my hospital. And then be cautious, realize these are not randomized clinical trials that we're looking at for reversal strategy. But also you have to think about when you're doing those studies, and these were actually trials because we were giving patients experimental uh, treatment. We didn't know how well they would work at the uh, time of the trial, is but what would you use for a comparison? Little hard to tell the patient that we got a drug out here it looks like from a kinetic standpoint, from a mechanistic standpoint, it works, but you have a lot of blood in your brain, but we're going to randomize you to placebo. So I think if you think through that, it sort of makes sense why we don't have a comparative trial. And there wasn't really at the time that these two agents were being developed, we didn't have robust data on efficacy of prothrombin complex concentrates. So they weren't really a viable at that time as a comparator. Um, be cautious about potential thromboembolic risk. Anytime, there's two things that I think happen. One is if you take away the anticoagulant, there was a reason the patient was on an anticoagulant. So their risk is going to go up. And then there are some theories and some signals that maybe some of these can uh, give, uh, could give clotting. Remember, if you're giving prothrombin complex concentrate, its job is to make clots. And then um, uh, redosing, we just have a little bit of information on redosing, i.e. you give a specific reversal agent, the patient continues to bleed. What's the safety and the balance between potential clotting if you redose? Next slide, please, Liz.
So what I'd like to do now, Liz, is if we can bring uh, the uh, all of our panelists up and if you can remember to unmute and uh, share your uh, video. And let's just have some uh, general uh, conversations about that background and the insights that we all uh, lent to this if we were uh, putting it uh, together. And I won't pick on anyone. I'll just ask who wants to go first. And if no one goes first, then I'll pick on someone. All right, Scott, this Adam, is Kelly. Was oh, oh, okay. Okay, go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> well, I don't want to jump the line, but um, we did collect some questions ahead of time. And in looking at those, um, you talked a bit about the background and the prevalence of the bleeding and how that's dispersed. I guess there's a number of questions that have come from the audience and myself as an outpatient practitioner. Do you treat all intracranial hemorrhages the same? So it's a smaller fraction of the bleeding, but certainly looking at the mortality, and I think that's the, probably the feared out of all the types of bleeding. Inpatient practitioners, do you consider them all the same in your approach um, to treating and reversing? And, you know, the secondary question is, you know, would you consider a different agent if it's small versus large? Well, we happen to have someone that works in the neurocritical ICU, and it's not me, so I'm going to let her answer this question. <laughs> I'll, t I'll take this one. Um, you know, I think this is a really great question, and it really poses some of the ethical challenges that we're facing in providing cost-effective care um, for anticoagulation reversal. Um, and really, you know, I think it highlights the need for collaborative, multidisciplinary decision making um, for who would benefit from reversal um, based on their location, their size, um, as well as the age of the hemorrhage. Um, you know, I, we know that anticoagulation is going to be a risk factor for hematoma expansion. And we also know that hematoma expansion is going to be a risk factor for poor outcomes um, in this patient population. So I really think an argument could be made for treating both large and small hemorrhages. Um, on one end, you know, large hemorrhages are going to be the ones that are, have the highest risk of hematoma expansion. So if you're thinking about what's going to be most, what population is going to get the most benefit in the efficacy endpoint of hematoma expansion, it's probably going to be your larger hemorrhages. Um, you know, with that, if you have a very large hemorrhage, you know, anticoagulation reversal might not be enough to improve your functional outcomes and mortality rates. Um, if it were, if the hemorrhage itself at baseline could result in severe disability on its own. Uh, you know, on the other hand, small hemorrhages are going to have a less propensity to bleed. Um, but, you know, if hematoma expansion does occur, it certainly could have a larger impact on the patient's long-term functional outcomes, depending on the location. So, um, you know, I really think it does need to be an individualized approach. Um, you know, I think you need to have a multidisciplinary conversation between neurology, neurosurgery, you know, the ED team, hematology, and really see, you know, what's this patient's, not only the risk of hematoma expansion, but their, worst, their risk of poor functional outcomes, whether we do nothing or if they were to have a hematoma expansion. Um, you know, the other thing I want to highlight is that hematoma expansion is going to be highest risk in the first three hours after onset, um, but you're also going to have a high risk after that three hours. Uh, so, you know, I think that suggests that there's still a benefit for reversal outside of the hyper acute window. Um, I will say, you know, at our institution, we do be mindful of subacute and chronic hematomas, the short duration of action of index not alpha is probably not going to be helpful in someone who has, you know, a stable subacute or chronic hematoma versus a hyperacute hematoma that's potentially unstable. So, um, you know, that's kind of our approach is taking it patient by patient based off of their risk. Right. Well, thanks, Megan. And, and, and I do know, as you've alluded to this, sometimes the, the bleeds are so big that nothing's going to prevent death. Right. And, and, and so we, we, we just, and, and, and again, I, I told everyone I don't do this work, but I'll tell you what I get as a hospitalist, not infrequently, is I will get the stable subdural hematoma and neurology gets consulted in the emergency room and they go, no, this really doesn't need the treatment right now. And those will come to me. Those decisions have already been made to reverse or not reverse the uh, anticoagulant before I get them. But, but, but I get um, not a lot, but many a year uh, that will uh, come through that uh, path. But there's a fair amount of art to this like there is in lots of uh, clinical uh, medicine. So, but I don't know of one set in stone rule. I will tell you one thing though, is if we jump to the other side of the coin, is that which intracranial uh, bleeds 
should maybe not get restarted on an anticoagulant. There are guidelines that will talk about, this is particularly in the atrial fibrillation patients, with the deep intraparenchymal bleeds, so deep mm -hmm. brain bleeds, not subdural bleeds, and particularly in the older patient, because that might be amyloid angiopathy. And sometimes we don't even let those patients get aspirin uh, with that type of uh, disease. And those the guidelines are fairly clear is that we don't do that. And that is where you would now be thinking about another mechanical device uh, to prevent the uh, clot from getting to a place. It won't prevent the clot. It'll just prevent the clot from going where you don't want it to go. Sure. Anybody else want to chime in on that question? Not on that one, but I, I saw some other questions coming through and I'm really interested to hear what the panel's view is on this. Two questions about what about adjunctive use of vitamin K and what about adjunctive use of antifibrinolytic drugs like tranexamic acid? Do either have a role in patients with DOAC associated bleeding? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the easy one. Vitamin, <laughs> the vitamin K makes no sense. No, don't do it. It's not going to hurt the patient, but it isn't going to do anything. And I, so I really advocate about not giving it because I'm afraid someone will get false hope if it was uh, given and not pay attention as, as, as closely as they should. So I'm a big advocate against no. If the emergency I, room gives it though incorrectly, it doesn't bother me because I don't think it's going to harm my patient. Sure. But I would say, you know, for your anticoagulation stewardship team also, you know, to look at your electronic health record, a lot of times that right does naturally get paired with case centra because we think about those two being a natural pairing for warfarin. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's a good place for your clinical team when you're reviewing your order sets and thinking about your clinical decision support, um, where we've paid close attention to make sure, you know, the education piece is there. We're consciously not putting it in that section with our DOAC reversal for using case center for the indication. Yeah. Same, we've created order sets that kind of split it out by drug choice first. That way they're kind of brought down that path to begin with versus having to try to figure out which one is which. Correct, yeah. yeah. All right, well, what about the hard one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, Adam, your thoughts, because what, what I've sort of noticed in the literature is transamic acid is really sort of getting more and expanding its use, or at least its studies. You know, I, I, think, it, I think the ball started rolling and now it's really rolling uh, with us. Looks like it's fairly safe. Looks like it's not real thrombogenic, uh, you know, so it's another one that's uh, not a lot to use, but at least this has a lot more, at least pharmacologic uh, underpinnings to make sense where vitamin K has none. Yeah, I agree, Scott. I think, um, you know, I'm not aware of good evidence uh, supporting or refuting the use of antifibrinolytic drugs for this particular indication, but extrapolating from other indications, I, I would be willing to use it. I don't think I would use it in just anybody. I think I would use it as an adjunct if somebody continued to bleed despite the more standard measures that that you outlined in the introduction and that are summarized in our document. And I think I would also think more about using it if there was bleeding that was occurring in an area that's rich in uh, fibrinolytic activity. So some parts of the body like, um, you know, the, like the mouth, for example, are very rich in fibrinolytic activity and antifibrinolytic agents tend to work very well for treating or preventing bleeding. But in other parts of the body, maybe um, this would be unusual, but like a muscle bleed, I don't think I would probably be, be as enthusiastic about, about using antifibrinolytics for that sort of bleed. As you noted, this really is evolving. I know there's, you know, some recent publications over the last few months in the stroke literature, probably Megan can speak to more eloquently than I can, but watching that, um, particularly for intracranial hemorrhage as an adjunct of therapy, very interesting thought for something pharmacologically that's much less expensive than some of the other things that might really augment. Right. Right. And, and I'm hoping so, but I've seen this movie once before with activated 7A in in a thing <laughs> bleeds where we all jumped on that bandwagon and thought it made sense. It was going to be good. And then uh, it, it, it turned out when we did the uh, randomized trials, but I think this certainly uh, uh, deserves the randomized trials, mm -hmm. but it seems to me, my, my feeling is, uh, is that it, 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 a little safer than uh, than 7A was, at least from a thrombogenic standpoint. 
Sure. And it's not, not first line in any of our protocols or probably even second line, but we've had those discussions for some of these really tough bleeders. Yeah. Yeah, I think definitely using it more as an adjunct measure in complicated mm -hmm. cases rather than, you know, replacing our standard therapies for reversal. Right. Great. Do we want to tackle any of the other uh, uh, questions uh, that I see before we go forward? Uh, there was one question that came up through the chat just for our, while we're on we're on the topic of ICH is that um, you know someone had asked what a, is considered a successful ICH anticoagulation reversal is it no bleed expansion you know twenty percent or less or thirty five percent or less um, and I will say that you know some bleed expansion is acceptable to to many providers and typically in the literature they'll either use a cutoff of 33% or more expansion of volume or 35% more or more expansion in hematoma volume to consider someone um, you know having poor hemostasis. I think that is also an important point with all of the studies looking at anticoagulation reversal in ICH patients is that you're going to get varied definitions across all the studies. Um, and I think that makes it really hard to compare one study to the other if you're using different definitions of what is considered hematoma expansion. Um, one might use any volume expansion whatsoever, and then others might use 33%, and others might use 35%. So I think, you know, when reading those studies, it's important to just keep that in mind is that it can be difficult to compare them to each other. I'll take one more question and then we'll go to the next uh, section and pick up some more. But, but a, a common uh, question is, uh, this question, is there more GI bleeding? Is it more pronounced with the bigger trend than factor 10 inhibitors? So I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one. So if we look at the four atrial fibrillation um, trials, I think it's important to know that three of those showed more GI bleeding than warfarin and one showed the same amount of bleeding as warfarin. I hear a lot of people say that apixaban was safer from a GI standpoint, and it wasn't, it was the same. And then I think people naturally wanna say then, well, apixaban is safer than the other three for GI bleeding. The only way you can do that was a head-to-head -head comparison. Now we've had lots of observational studies that try to uh, to try to adjust for differences in population, then to um, to answer that. But from a pure randomized uh, clinical trial standpoint, we don't know that one has more GI bleeding than the other. Where this uh, question uh, might be uh, also getting to is the dibigatran dyspepsia that you can get in about 10% of mm -hmm. patients, but that has nothing to do with gastric or duodenal erosion. That's sort of a side effect that is not an increased bleeding and there isn't harm to the uh, mucosa. Okay. Liz, can we jump back to slides uh, for a moment? And now let's go to the uh, dosing and timing stuff. So this is a section where we have it on the, uh, on the one pager and let's go to the next slide, please. And now we'll blow it up uh, for everybody. So what we have here, is, and we're going to go through the, uh, uh, the this is going to be a kinetic uh, conversation here because it's all based on that. So Adam, I don't know about you, but anytime we start talking about pharmacokinetics, I sure am glad to have some pharmacists on board with me. <laughs> so um, I'll let you read this. This is really the package uh, label, but I think what we'll, we'll talk about these in a minute. I just want to bring this up for discussion. We're going to now move back to panel and you can, if you printed this up and look at this, this is straight out of the package insert, but because it depends and everyone can come back on, um, on uh, video chat, but because it is the timing dictates the dose, that's why we put it there because if you don't do this very frequently, we wanted to put that really big so you could just look at this and bang and know what the uh, correct uh, dose with. And since in Dexanet Alpha, uh, particularly with the timing, there's a difference of about $24,000 between the low and high dose. It's important. That's really gets at least the inpatient pharmacist's attention uh, with this when it's in their uh, cost uh, center. So could one of the pharmacists for a minute, why the different doses? What, what's the underpinnings behind that? Why? different between molecules, why different between uh, timing? 
we're a shy group. <laughs> yeah, well, well, so I think well, it really one comes. Yeah, one of you go. <laughs> this is, this is, well, I think you know, it really comes. It really comes down to exposure, right? So you want to use the right amount of drug, right? Essentially to reverse the amount of drug pharmacologically you think is active in there. So, you know, based on, you know, the average half-life for these. So certainly, you know, as I think about it, it's not always necessarily cut and dry. You know, if patients have compromised renal function or they're bleeding so significantly that their renal function is compromised. You know, I, I think for me, you know, especially if it's on the fence, you know, that cut off of eight hours, you know, magically something happens at, you know, 7.5 hours instead of eight hours, but, you know, really tailoring the amount of reversal agent to pharmacologically the amount of drug that you would expect on board. Certainly one of the other questions we received is, you know, sometimes these patients just show up and they're not able to tell you. So I think, you know, right, so in that situation we put here, if we're unclear of when that last dose was to err on the side of a higher dose. Um, depending upon which agent, right, once a day versus twice a day, you know, right, that definitely changes a bit of the conversation um, in there. But again, as you noted, you know, we want to reverse at the right amount, both pharmacologically and from the budget side, but we don't want too much drug on board that would additionally then prolong the time that the patient um, would be unanticoagulated. Okay. So a couple of questions. So first of all, is the is the timing just for indexinet alpha or does it apply also to idarucizumab? Nope, that's really just for indexinet alpha. So right, it would be standard dosing for idarucizumab if we're reversing to bigatran or if you know we're considering PCCs. Um, the timing really only plays into index and up from that standpoint, though I think it would be due diligence, right? So to still think about what the pharmacologic half-life is, you know, if it's been 24 or 36 hours of their last abigatran dose, I'm not really gonna be too hot to fire up a bunch of um for that patient if pharmacologically, I think there's very little left. So I think that's where your pharmacy team can come in and help you, you know, if you think about the standard half-life, but as well as where the patient is at and estimating how much drug is still on board. For all of the agents, we just have the specific dosing for index in it. Right, and I agree because the beauty of this for the vast majority of bleeds, and that's why I think the FDA says, and also our, 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 our one pager says, our rapid resource says, is that for life-threatening or continuing bleed. Because if you're a couple mm -hmm. of days out from any of the DOACs, you probably, time is on your side. The bigger trend, the thing that always worries me, the, the scenario right. where I can worry a bit about if it was a day or a day and a half, the GI bleed, that led to acute tubular necrosis and now the kidneys aren't working because now a day and a half or two days ago no longer is in play with an 80% elimination uh, through the uh, uh, kidneys. And then uh, the, the way at least I teach medical students sure. as I say, low doses don't need as much drug as high doses. And if the drug was given a while ago, then the body's gotten rid of some of it. So you need a lower dose than a uh, higher dose. And I agree, I don't draw eight hours in the sand. The trials had to do something to operationalize uh, the, the Anexa 4 uh, sure. trial. But I agree, if I'm seven and a half hours away or eight and a half hours away, and the patient has a severe bleed, I'm erring on the side of uh, more. Whether that's correct or not, I don't know. See, Scott, pharmacology is easy. Yep. <laughs> right. Well, so one of the things that we definitely struggle with is our unknown patients, mm -hmm. uh, where we don't know when the last dose is. And I think really, you know, as a community, the best that we can do for these situations is trying to counsel patients when they're on anticoagulation to kind of keep like a wallet card or something saying, when do they normally take their anticoagulant? Um, you know, if someone has a car that says that they normally take their anticoagulant in, at breakfast and they're coming in at, you know, midnight overnight, I think it's safe to assume that it's been, you know, more than 18 hours. Um, and Adam will go in more into the laboratory monitoring in a little bit, but, um, you know, I think that's really informative and that's an opportunity for, you know, all providers to be able to counsel patients to really help us inform um, during those acute situations. Uh, the other thing I don't know about your guys' experience at other institutions, at your institutions, but I find that we mostly use the low dose regimen. And I think when we were adding index net to formulary, our concern was how much high dose regimens we'll be using. 
Um, so I think it's a little bit reassuring that for the most part, most of these patients are falling into the low dose category. Yeah. My yeah. institution, we, we don't have it, but one of the things, we were a health system, so one of the things we've done on the outpatient side is we've added into our notes administration time. So if the inpatient side did, in, did get into a pickle, they could kind of look at our notes and see what is kind of the relative amount of time or when do mm -hmm. they typically take it. Um, but the wallet card's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So Megan, to your uh, point, so uh, uh, led by uh, one of uh, uh, the residents here in several pharmacists, and we combined some data uh, with a group in uh, Boston also and had a, an ISTH uh, poster virtual, of course, uh, this uh, summer. But we looked at about 100 doses between the two uh, institutions for Indexinet Alpha, and we found a high proportion. This is on retrospective chart review. Where, we, where someone actually documented the timing and the dose where we could actually tell. There was a chunk of those where you couldn't tell what dose was appropriate. And we found a bunch of high dose used when it shouldn't have been. And this was documented. So someone knew this because they wrote that down. I mean, to the tune of about $300,000 in excess uh, pharmacy uh, cost uh, with this. So I, I, I think our, our educational process, as we learned that pharmacy got really excited about this and said, let's get this out and try to ask those questions. And I can't remember if we've done it in our order set or we're trying to get in our order set, but really guide those and ask those questions. Those Same here, Scott. Fine, you know, in, in, in there to... Uh, uh, to, to save that. And also in theory, you don't want to, if you give too much reversal, no matter what it is, in theory, you can get more clotting. And so it's not just a dollar sign, it's actually a potential harm issue, I think also. I'd be curious uh, to sure, hear what- you know, Definitely here, been, been... Sorry, go, go ahead, ahead Megan. Megan. Oh, sorry, I think we were cutting out a little bit with the connectivity. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious to hear what all your um, institutions are doing to help leverage your order sets to guide appropriate use. I think that's something that we definitely struggled with when we were bringing this onto formulary, um, whether it be uh, PCCs, APCCs, idorosizumab, or indexinet. Um, have you guys built specific anticoagulation reversal order sets in your EHR? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. at our institution... We have, we don't have index, so we're, we're kind of a rural, smaller type hospital system, um, but we've definitely tried to drive prescribing through order sets to the point where we've, we've questioned turning off alternative prescribing options, um, but we'll do through our steering committee a quarterly review of reversal for everything and look at was it appropriate, what's our dosing, where are we at financially, um, and I think that's really brought a lot of attention to what are we doing, how are we doing it, and are we doing it the right way with what we have. Yeah, and, and, and then we haven't even yet opened up the can of worms of if you don't have that, like Ronnie's shop, then what's the right, what dose of PCC, you know, should it be activated or non-activated? Should it be fixed dose? Should it be weight dose uh, base is a no, whole another conversation. I'm not sure we're going to have enough time to get to that. We might have to do a follow-up webinar just to uh, <laughs> tackle uh, that one because there's a lot of variability out there. Mm -hmm. We sort of landed in our guidance statement last year and co-authors that are on this call, remind me if I get this wrong, but we sort of tended to go to a 2000 unit fixed dose as our, as our starting point with that. Because at the time of that 2019 uh, paper, we had some observational studies mm -hmm. that sort of uh, had the most evidence, if you will. That's rapidly changing, however. And, and, and that's one of those guidance statements that probably you know, every year or so will need to be updated. It's not like COVID where you have to update it every other day, but it's still, <laughs> this is rapidly moving where we might have to every year or so, it probably deserves mm -hmm. a peek at, at some of those uh, guidance. And, and I, I want to tell everybody what we're going to be, one of the beauties of these rapid resources are, is what we're building a program to look at these episodically. Uh, mm -hmm. And or at least when we know there's been enough uh, information that's changed and we may be updating these, but then it's nice we just repost 
the new updated uh, one pager if the uh, science changes. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of debate on the, the fixed dose versus weight-based dosing. And one thing I always think about is that, you know, 2,000 unit fixed dose is essentially 25 units or per kilo or more in, you know, an 80 kilogram patient or less. So, um, you know, looking at the studies and how the dosing varies so much, but most of it's pretty much between 25 and 50 units per kilo. And, and I, I've, I've heard some people say the, the upside to that is is you don't have to worry about the calculation and how I order it and what I do. It's just simple, straightforward, give it, get started. Because here, uh, Megan, particularly in your field where the blood's in the head, speed is of importance uh, here. It's not like GI bleeds, which I see because I just give more blood and I can uh, keep up with that. That's not the uh, that's not the game in the blood in the head. And then if the hematoma is expanding, then give another and then take them up to essentially 50, if you would, if you repeated the dose. Mm -hmm. Megan, there seems to be a lot of questions around that 25 to 50. Or in your experience, have you seen the 50 used or at what point would you consider? Like, do you do it on severity of bleeding or do you guys just stick with the same dose? Yeah, so I think, um... Currently, all of most of the guidelines will recommend 50 units per kilo um, or 37.5 to 50 units per kilo. I think what we've seen in the past year and a half is there's been a lot of observational studies that have come out looking at that 25 to 50 unit per kilo range. Um, so I think right now it's currently a little bit provider dependent in that we were previously mainly using the 50 unit per kilo, but now there's some circumstances where we will, you know, consider the 25 unit per kilo. Um, just because you're going to have a higher thrombosis risk with the higher dosing if someone, you know, would requires reversal, but maybe we do okay with 25 units per kilo. That, that's an option that we do. Um, we don't have a standard dose at our institution um, currently. Uh, we, we have transitioned to Andexina, but prior to that, um, we were using the 50 unit per kilo um, for, most, for the most part, um, but that was prior to many of these studies coming out. Right. right, and I do know everybody that there is a randomized trial with um, Indexinet Alpha versus PCC, mm -hmm. but it's my understanding, I'm not participating, so I haven't read the protocol, but my understanding that is sort of local decision on what that dose of PCC is. Mm -hmm. So we might have enough, maybe enough power to get some glimpses of one dose versus the other in that control arm, but it won't be a direct uh, comparison, dose A versus dose B. Sure. Okay, great. So that's Liz's sneaky way to tell us that we need to get to the next uh, section. So thank you, Liz. Let's uh, bring this up and Adam's gonna lead uh, this uh, discussion. Liz, if you can uh, have next slide, please. Great. So here is the uh, uh, laboratory assessment. And we are very, very lucky because not only is uh, Adam a dear colleague and, and friend uh, that I've gotten to know quite well through uh, anticoagulation form and a board member, but is one of, if not the world's expert in this uh, area. So Adam, I'm going to uh, let you lead this part of the discussion and I'm eager to learn from you. Thank you. Thanks for the kind word, Scott. You made me blush. Um, so yes, laboratory testing is an important way of getting at how much DOAC is on board in your patients. Although I'll remind you that one of the top level points was if the lab result isn't going to come back right away and your patient is having serious bleeding, don't wait for the lab test result before making a decision about whether to use a reversal agent. That said, we can sort of classify our useful assays into two groups. Assays that can actually tell us what the concentration of the DOAC is in plasma, and assays that, that can tell us whether or not there is a clinically significant amount of DOAC in plasma. And we put up here at the top of the table what we mean by clinically significant, and we acknowledge that that's a somewhat nebulous term, but probably levels in excess of 50 nanograms per milliliter could be considered significant and potentially contributing to bleeding. Mm 
So just very quickly, assays that are suitable for measuring DOAC levels. These are the sorts of tests that you may not even have available at your institution, or if you have available, you probably can't get it on a stat basis in a bleeding patient in the emergency room. But if the patient is taking dabigatran, the dilute thrombin time, the ecrin chromogenic assay, if they're taking a pixaban, a doxaban, a rivaroxaban, an anti-10A assay calibrated with the drug of interest will all do the trick. The gold standard test, by the way, for measuring levels of all these drugs is liquid chromatography tandem mass spec. But again, it's very unlikely that most of us will have these tests available to us on a stat basis. And so are there any tests you can order where you can get an immediate result back that will give you a sense about whether you're potentially dealing with clinically important levels of drugs or not? So the answer is yes. If the patient has been taking dabigatran and you order a thrombin time and the thrombin time is normal, that rules out the presence of clinically relevant levels. A prolonged thrombin time could suggest the presence of clinically relevant levels or even trivial levels that are still long enough to prolong the test, but normal thrombin time rules it out. Similarly, with the with a pixaban, a doxaban, a rivaroxaban, even if you don't have a drug-specific anti-10 assay available, many of us at our institutions can pretty quickly get a heparin or low molecular weight heparin anti-10A level. And if the level is below the lower limit of quantitation, that is pretty good evidence that you don't have clinically relevant drug levels on board. I'll just point out that there's this other test uh, available in Europe, though not, not yet in the United States, called the urine doesense test. It's a dipstick and it has similar properties. So if you dip the urine and it doesn't come out positive for dabigatran or apixaban or rivaroxaban, that tells you that there are almost certainly not clinically relevant plasma levels on board. I just wanna make one other point, Scott, um, and, and that is that you'll notice that in this table, I did not include the PT and the PTT. And that is because those assays in general are not sufficiently sensitive to rule out clinically relevant levels of these drugs. So for the most part, you cannot assume that a normal PT and PTT rules out the possibility of drug levels above 50 nanograms per milliliter. Well, wonderful. Let's everybody uh, come uh, back on. So Adam, uh, uh, very, very nice as usual. Thank you. So I got to tell you though, it, I think in the emergency room, our EMR, because it has some voice recognition and dictation, and if the patient says anticoagulation, it automatically orders a PT and PTT. You can't not get it. So, but, but that will virtually never be useful here in this situation. But I love the fact that we have drugs. I think I can remember... Dave Garcia and I having this a conversation when when the when the DOEX were first coming out, you know, over a decade ago, and everyone started saying, "How are we going to measure?" I'm going for 50 years. We complained about warfarin. Oh my goodness, I have to measure this. This is so hard. We just need a drug that we don't have to measure. And as soon as we got those drugs, we said, "Well, how do we measure them?" So uh, make up our minds, okay? But I think uh, for this most part, it's drug yes no is uh, oh, but but we know i think it's also important in both the idiriucizumab uh, uh trial and in the indexinet alpha uh, trials is that a large proportion of those patients got it because they grabbed levels right before they gave this because they're in the research mode and it was something like almost a quarter of the patients didn't have high levels where we wouldn't expect that the drug would do anything um, with that. Um, so, but it just tells you uh, to Megan and others uh, points that sometimes you just can't get an answer from the patient. They just don't know. And if they're unconscious, you can't get the uh, answer. Uh, so, but it would be handy if you could save the money. I know a lot of people talk about indexing it, but I don't know. I dare you, Sizabab in my shop is still in the 45 to 50, Five hundred dollar uh, range and uh, PCCs are still several thousand dollars, and we have to worry about the potential there for increased thrombosis. But if you could get those rapidly in, say, in in the data that we have so far in the New England, about a quarter of those patients probably didn't need that. 
They got it because of the urgency of the situation. And we say right up front, don't wait for it. But if the GI bleed, you know, the hemoglobin's okay, blood pressure's on the border, you're thinking about that, but you think you got another 15, 20, 30 minutes, might be reasonable to uh, sort that out. One of the other questions that came through that I thought was really interesting is um, the utilization of TAG for monitoring DOACs. Does anyone on uh, the call here have any experience with that or uh, have you guys explored that at all? Megan, I think I can speak to that. Um, so there are a number of studies that uh, report on the relationship between TAG and DOAC levels. And what's clear is that there are um, dose dependent changes in, in various TEG parameters um, with the DOACs, but um, there are not to the point where we are able to say that if such and such parameter is less than such and such, that that means that there aren't clinically significant DOAC levels on board. So dose dependent changes, but to my knowledge, no parameters or thresholds that, that, that would be clinically useful for decision-making. Again, it seems well, like from those from those studies that you can, if it's very, if someone has a very high level, you might be able to tell on the tag. But if they have a normal level, it's just not going to show up at all. Right. Um, I have heard that there's a new uh, DOAC panel that's coming through with the tag F a six S. So I think we'll see how that sensitivity and specificity plays out. But that you know is something that could be an option in the future. It'd be interesting. Yeah. I, I love uh, quoting Mark Crowther because he, 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 he's so clever, but I've heard him say, TAG has been a laboratory test that's been searching for an indication. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it's been around for 80 years or something. Uh, yes. <laughs> Not for DOAX currently. <laughs> right. Well, I'm just, uh, you all have been uh, helping me manage these uh, questions. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, I'm looking through some of, has anyone seen a question that we maybe haven't uh, answered so far? There definitely oh. seems to be a lot of questions around, outside of the lab area of when to restart. Um, you know, how do you, how do you reassess that patient to determine, you know, when can we restart their anticoag after a bleed, whether it was major or non-major? Um, from outpatient perspective, my thought is that the anticoagulation indication did not go away, so we need to do something about that. Um, from my end, we defer a lot to the specialist, particularly with intracranial hemorrhage. GI bleeds, it sounds cavalier, but they happen. Um, we find out why they happen. We do diagnostic testing. We do some imaging. We hopefully prevent the bleed from happening, and then you restart. Um, and in my mind, we, you know, typically two weeks if you find out the cause. Um, that seems to be a question a lot of when do you restart a GI bleed? And I'm sure there are other indications or seriousness that you would do longer, um, but I feel like a lot of the studies or observational trials that are out there say two weeks is about when things can restart again. Yeah, so I, I had a fight with GI. I mean, a uh, careful educational patient centric <laughs> uh, conversation uh, this morning with a patient that no one would want to scope because of their comorbidities and age and stuff. But my question is, is I had to, I have to know that high mm -hmm. risk. And if you tell me there's a, a, a a big colon cancer or tons of ABMs or a big gastric ulcer, that's going to guide on how I want to do this because there was some urgency to getting back on the antithrombotic therapy. So sometimes that takes a little bit of a conversation. Um, Dan Witt, one of our uh, 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 prior board members, uh, did some of the seminal uh, work with this in an observational study and looking at when could you do that. It was mostly in an AFib GI bleed to just get this uh, uh, centered a, a little bit. Um, Wakaj Karishi, who was a uh, cardiology fellow when he did the work at my institution, had a wonderful observational study where he actually, he's got the survival curve, so they look like like this on how often what happened with mortality. And if you didn't start an anticoagulant, the mortality rate down here lower as bad as the survival curve was the worst. But you flip that around from re-bleeds. The sooner you started, the more you bled. But the sweet spot 
was in the two to three week range. And there's been other observations. Nate Clark, one of our board members has also showed that there's a series of observational studies now that's showing that. So I'd be curious what Adam uh, does, but I use for a GI bleed somewhere in restarting in about the two week range, given the caveat that I know what the lumens look like and what I have. And I'm just gonna take these one at a time. Uh, Adam, uh, what, what's sort of your gut feeling on when uh, to restart from GI bleed, whether it's AFib or VTE? Yeah, Scott, I think that sounds about right. And of course, there's going to be factors that make us right. individualize the decision, thrombotic risk, was the lesion identified and addressed, things like that. I, I just wanted to make a separate point too, which is that I think whenever we think about restarting, it's also an important opportunity to revisit the indication for anticoagulation. And many of these patients are on concomitant antiplatelet therapy and to revisit the appropriateness of that. Yeah, yeah. And also the patient education, right? A lot of times, right, patients may not be fully compliant or doing things additional over the counter that might have contributed to this. Um, so we take that as the opportunity to do another round of patient education carefully also. Yeah, but if you're in the outpatient anticoagulation clinic and you follow DOAC patients, I would, uh, what I use in GI bleeds is two weeks as mm -hmm. a starting point, right? right? And so if someone is saying, let's wait two or three months, I think you sort of have to question that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I want to go four weeks instead of two weeks, I wouldn't uh, get there. Uh, and then uh, Megan, we've already talked about the, uh, uh, the deep parenchymal bleeds. But how about uh, guidance on sort of the uh, uh, subdurals or the traumatic bleed that we don't think is, uh, is um, uh, angio, um, amyloid angiopathy? I think it, it definitely depends on the patient, their risk factors, as well as the size of the bleed. Um, you know, very large hemorrhages, if they have a strong indication for anticoagulation, we will wait four to six weeks before feeling comfortable restarting anticoagulation. Um, but if it's a very small hemorrhage and the, you know, thrombotic risk is high, similar in that like the two, two to four week mark is where, um, you know, we start considering restarting. Uh, it's nice if someone's in the hospital and they restart anticoagulation because then you can, you know, slowly escalate the intensity and get a repeat scan. Um, but that's not always possible, especially for patients who have a short hospital length of stay. Yeah. So Megan, for those of us on the outpatient side, you know, so if, if there is that recommendation to wait, you know, several weeks to restart, would you, do they routinely recommend serial monitoring or another scan prior to reinitiation or just go off of the patient's symptomatology? Yeah, a lot of times I would say that they have a follow-up appointment with neurology and at that point they make the decision of whether or not to restart um, based off of their progress after uh, discharge. Some guidelines and guidance that I've sent is suggested four weeks. So what I do just as a practical starting point, given all the caveats, about two weeks for a GI bleed, about four weeks for a, uh, for a bleed. And I always try to talk to the people that looked at the bleed and were experts to get some guidance on that, but just to help everybody. We are nearly uh, right at the uh, top of the hour. Wonderful questions, everybody. I can't thank panelists enough for, for putting this resource together and for all your expertise tonight. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Liz uh, to have us close us out. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our speakers, Dr. Scott Cates, Megan Barra, Adam Sucker, Ronnie Nemeth, and Kelly Rudd. Thank you so much. As Scott said, thank you for creating this tool and thank you for sharing your expertise on this webinar tonight. I mentioned that we have, um, this is one of 12 rapid resources. Here are some of the topics um, and you can find them all in the resource center of our centers of excellence. We, um, our February webinar is another ex rapid resource and this one's on vascular protection for patients with CAD, PAD and you can register now on our website. It's, it's gonna be Tuesday, February 16th. Lastly, to claim your credit, instructions here to claim your credit, you can go to this direct link. It's in the chat and it's also on Easy Forum's website. And lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Alexion, for funding this project tonight. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.